the whole idea about this job was basically creating an epic visual experiment to represent seven different taste notes of Hennessy. And the director was Ridley Scott, and he decided to do this whole thing in a four minute short film. Each of these seven taste notes uh, was supposed to be represented in seven different worlds, and they all had unique challenges and unique R&Ds to them. In the Woodcrunch sequence, the idea is to signify the early tones of fantasy. There's a golem in it, which is essentially in the forest. This shape-shifting character, he's walking through the woods and he's absorbing different elements. The wood, the stones, all the plants get attracted to him, react to him. The birds are swirling, almost like swirling around him in the sequence. We used Houdini's fur tools to groom and render the birds. Uh, we've got our own custom procedural sort of vex-based feather generation system. Since it's all procedural, once we had the fully groomed bee eater, we generate proxies and lower res uh, assets for the crowds. We were able to leverage the procedural workflow of Houdini to extract um, a model of the bird with card-based feathers uh, from the high res uh, bee eater and generate uh, multiple proxies for using in the flocking. And also the variations were easy to do because it's all ramps, it's, there's not, not much textures involved. So we could generate variations based on seed values uh, to get different colors, different schemes, put a lot of assets, put a lot of versions in front of the client to be able to you know, get approval on, on, on the colors. And then once we had them ready, we could just feed that into the flocking system and instance them um, for the crowds of, of birds. Uh, just quite, quite easy to do because it's all in Houdini and it's all quite procedural. I was tasked with creating the, the wood golem for the wood crunch sequence. The way I've uh, managed to accomplish the, the wood cruncher is by using a, a mixture of a bullet and a grain solver. So we had about a million spheres being simulated in bullet and they were almost real time, which was super helpful. Um, and being able to after simulating rendering, being able to go all the way back up to the root and change certain bits, like if on the arm they didn't, they, they said there's too many leaves, too many twigs, we could just paint, paint out different assets. Um, and the way Houdini helped achieve that was by being able to manage large uh, amount of assets uh, really easily using packed primitives. I worked on the Infinite Echo sequence in the project, which is the last sequence, and it involves uh, basically showing the whole, all the planets and the different worlds um, together. One example of the planets we see is um, the green wood cruncher planet. These had to look seamless, so it had to be a magic trail in, in a sense, where you couldn't see any visual particles, but rather it had to look like, yeah, magic. The way I solved this was in a fairly classic way. I did a pyrosim for the bulk movement of the particles, then I advected a lot of them through this, and in the end I replicated the particles with a custom tool, or basically a custom OTL I built, to get the seamless look working. The Flowing Flames is a sequence where you got a lot of clouds and basically it represents the sensation that you get um, when you take a sip from the drink. So this whole world is basically made of clouds so you can't really land on it, you just have to flow through. And we had pretty much you know, only two assets on this whole sequence, one being the clouds and the other is glider. We rendered the whole thing in Mantra, but I think the main challenge was uh, not just rendering it but basically creating the simulations of these clouds. We had limited time, so we had to come up with a system that is performant enough and also, you know, artistically friendly to do the layouts. To tackle this whole uh, challenge, basically, we had to create our own setup. I think we were using 16.5 at the time. Our lead artist on the sequence did a workflow um, with OpenCL. He leveraged OpenCL quite a bit, actually, because uh, the whole sequence had very slow moving uh, clouds. We kind of uh, used that to our advantage and used static um, clouds for a while. And 
ask the um, layout artists and lighting artists to set the shots lit with statics. And then it was quite easy to turn them into moving clouds afterwards once they were kind of uh, okayed and approved. We, we also had a procedural system that would generate um, proxy uh, polygon mesh for the layout artists to basically do the layout and we would just convert them into clouds really. Looking at the scale of work that we've, we've completed on this job and the, and the different different design decisions, the different design aspects of it, and, and how some of it was quite, you know, based on quite algorithmic behaviors or, or like simple maths and physics, and some of it was just pure design. Being able to work procedurally gives you confidence that the results you get in one scene can be translated across multiple scenes. One of the things I'm still, you know, uh, feeling good about is being able to create so many different concepts and so many different tests in a very short time. There's even uh, sequences that didn't go into the film that we actually created tons of versions of. So I think that's what I'm proud of. I don't think we could have done it if we didn't have access to some, things, to some of the features Houdini gives us because I think to a certain extent, uh, sky's the limit.